Welcome back to Very Ordinary Differential Equations. In this lecture, we return to our study of second-order linear equations with constant coefficients, but now we assume we have a forcing function which is an exponential. Specifically, we are now going to consider how to find particular solutions to second-order linear differential equations with constant coefficients where the forcing function is an exponential. So here we have a second order linear differential equation with constant coefficients and the forcing function is some constant times e to some multiple of x. So here is the equation we want to find a particular solution to. Well, derivatives of e to the lambda x are going to be other multiples of e to the lambda x. So let's just assume that our particular solution is also some multiple of e to the lambda x and attempt to solve for what that multiple is. Well, the second derivative is just going to be a lambda squared e to the lambda x. The first derivative is just a lambda e to the lambda x. So we end up being able to cancel out e to the lambda x from everything. And we can factor a capital A out on the left because remember capital A is actually the only thing we're trying to solve for here. So if e to the lambda x does not solve the complementary homogeneous equation, well then, this quadratic in lambda will not be zero. Remember, setting this equal to zero and solving for lambda is how we found which e to the lambda x will solve a y double prime plus b y prime plus c y equals zero. So, assuming that lambda does not set a lambda squared plus b lambda plus c equals zero, in other words, e to the lambda x does not solve the complementary homogeneous equation, then all we have to do to solve for a is divide by that polynomial. But what if e to the lambda x does solve the complementary equation? Well, let's suppose that a r squared plus b r plus c has two distinct real roots and lambda is one of them. Then what we would do is we would try, instead of just a times e to the lambda x, we would try a x e to the lambda x. In which case we compute its first and second derivatives as follows. We go back to the original equation. We're still gonna be able to cancel an e to the lambda x from every single term and you'll end up with this expression right here. And remember, we're trying to solve for a. So I factor in a out of the left. Having factored the a out of the left, we have this expression right here. Now there's still an x left, which is a little inconvenient because we're trying to find a nice explicit value of a. However, the coefficient of x is assumed to be zero. We assumed that lambda was a root of a r squared plus b r plus c. So that coefficient on x is actually zero. And we end up with just this, a times two a lambda plus b equals k. Now we assumed that it's not the only root of the characteristic polynomial. So in other words, the characteristic polynomial of a r squared plus b r plus c is not just a polynomial whose only root is lambda. If you expand this out and say it's not equal to what's on the left, you end up saying lambda is not equal to negative b over 2a. In other words, this expression right here is not zero. And if that coefficient is not zero, you can divide by it to get a must be k over 2a lambda plus b. So this is how you account for what to do when lambda is a root of a r squared plus b r plus c, but it is not the only root. Well, what do you do if lambda is in fact the only root of a r squared plus b r plus c? Well, then the complementary equation would have a fundamental set of solutions given by e to the lambda x and x e to the lambda x. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try setting y sub p equal to something times x squared e to the lambda x. So we compute its first and second derivative, and we take these into the differential equation we started with. We're still gonna be able to cancel an e to the lambda x out of everything, and we end up with this expression right here. Okay, so having canceled e to the lambda x out of everything, we have little a times all of this for yp double prime. There it is. Little b times all of that. Little c times ax squared must equal k and we're trying to solve this for a. So if we have this expression and we're trying to solve it for a, we can factor a capital A out of everything on the left. In this expression, however, we've got x squareds and we've got x's. But since lambda was assumed to be the only root of the characteristic polynomial, then the characteristic polynomial must be of the form a times r minus lambda squared. 
Therefore, lambda must be negative b over 2a. So not only does lambda set this equal to 0, it also sets this equal to 0 here. So with both of those coefficients of x squared and x respectively being equal to 0, we just get capital A times 2 little a is equal to k, and now we can directly solve that capital A must be k over 2a. So let's refresh what we've got so far. Given a second order differential equation with constant coefficients and an exponential forcing function. So here's our general form. Second order, constant coefficients, exponential forcing. We're trying to find one particular solution, y sub p. If lambda is not a root of a r squared plus b r plus c, just set our particular solution to be a times e to the lambda x, where a is explicitly computable by that formula there. If lambda is a root, but it's not the only one, then we use our particular solution is a x e to the lambda x, where once again, a is explicitly computable by this formula. But if lambda is in fact the only root, then we let our particular solution be capital A times x squared e to the lambda x, where capital A again has a nice explicit formula. So we have an interesting kind of trade-off here. If lambda is not a root, we have a pretty simple forcing function where the coefficient takes a little bit of work to solve. If lambda is the only root, we have a substantially more complicated uh, proposed solution, but the coefficient a is easier to solve for. We can combine all this work with the superposition principle as needed if our forcing function has multiple terms. Once again, let's put theory into practice by finding one particular solution to y double prime plus 3y prime minus 4y equals x minus e to the 2x. Now that forcing function is a sum of two things, the polynomial x and the exponential term e to the 2x. So we're going to find two different functions, yp1 and yp2, so that yp1 should produce the term x and yp2 will produce the term e to the 2x. Then by the superposition principle, our solution yp will just be the difference of those two things. So first, we're going to try to find a yp1 so that if I plug it into the differential equation, I get out an x. So we have a differential equation with constant coefficients and a polynomial forcing function. So we assume that yp1 is a polynomial of the same degree as the forcing function and attempt to solve. Well, the forcing function is of degree 1, so we assume yp1 is of degree 1. Therefore, its first derivative is just a, its second derivative is 0. So we're trying to find a yp1 that solves our differential equation to produce a forcing function of x, and we've determined that it must be linear, and then we have computed its first and second derivative, so we throw all that into the differential equation. 0 plus 3a minus 4ax minus 4b must be equal to x. Therefore, negative 4a, which is how many x's we have on the left, must be equal to 1, which is how many x's we have on the right. And 3a minus 4b, which is our constant on the left, must be equal to 0, our constant on the right. We quickly solve this to get a is negative 1 quarter and b is negative 3 sixteenths. So we set yp1 to be negative 1 quarter x minus 3 sixteenths. Next, we want to find a yp2 so that if we throw it into the differential equation, it produces e to the 2x. How to proceed depends very much on whether 2 is or is not a root of the complementary polynomial. It's not, so all we have to do is set yp2 to be some multiple of e to the 2x, and specifically that capital A is given by 1 over the complementary polynomial evaluated at 2, so just 1 over 6. So we let yp2 be e to the 2x over 6. So we have found that yp1 can be set to be negative x over 4 minus 3 sixteenths, and yp2 can be e to the 2x over 6. We call back on the superposition principle and let yp be their difference, so that's just negative x over 4 minus 3 sixteenths minus e to the 2x over 6. So there is one solution to the differential equation. Next, let's find all solutions to y double prime minus 2y prime minus 8y is 5e to the 3x plus 2e to the 4x. And again, we're going to go through term by term. Both terms of the forcing functions are exponentials, so in order to find particular solutions to generate each one, we're going to need to know what is and isn't a root of the complementary polynomial. All right, so we set up our complementary equation. It generates its own complementary polynomial, r squared minus 2r minus 8. That factors as r minus 4, r plus 2. So it has two roots of 4 and minus 2. 
They're distinct roots, so we get a fundamental set of solutions to just be e to the 4x and e to the minus 2x. We found a fundamental set of solutions to the complementary equation. That's great. Now we can turn our attention to the forcing functions. First, we have 5e e to the 3x. e to the 3x is not one of the powers in our fundamental set of solutions to the complementary equation. So we just have to set yp1 to be a times e to the 3x, where a is computed as 5, this coefficient here, divided by the complementary polynomial evaluated at the power 3. And that works out to just be minus 1. So we can set yp1 to be negative e to the 3x. If you throw that into the differential equation, you will indeed get 5 e to the 3x. Next, we want to find something to throw into the differential equation that will produce 2 e to the 4x. However, e to the 4x was in the fundamental set of solutions for the complementary equation. But x e to the 4x was not. So for yp2, we can use ax e to the 4x, where a is computed as 2 over this expression, which again depends on the coefficient in front of the term, which was just a2, and a certain expression evaluated at the power of 4. This works out to just be 1 third, so we can set yp2 to be 1 third times x e to the 4x. Now we can construct a particular solution, thanks to the superposition principle, as a sum of the two things we found, negative e to the 3x plus x e to the 4x over 3. So we have found one particular solution, negative e to the 3x plus x e to the 4x over 3. We also found a fundamental set of solutions to the complementary equation, e to the 4x and e to the minus 2x. Therefore, the general solution is given by the particular solution we found plus linear combinations of the fundamental set. So it's the particular solution plus some constant times e to the 4x plus some other constant times e to the negative 2x. As a third example, let's find the general solution, in other words, all possible solutions, to 2y double prime minus 4y prime plus 5y equals x squared plus 6 e to the x minus 2 e to the minus x. Well, the forcing function has three terms in it. One is a polynomial and two are exponential. So we're going to need to find three different pieces, yp1, yp2, yp3, to create these when used in the differential equation. And then we will take our particular solution to be the sum and difference of them according to whether our forcing function is the sum or difference of the pieces. We also have to find a fundamental set of solutions to the complementary equation, 2y double prime minus 4y prime plus 5y equals 0. That will affect how we find yp2 and yp3, because whether these exponentials of e to the x and e to the minus x solve or don't solve this complementary equation will change how we find the particular solutions to get them out as forcing functions. Well, here is the complementary equation, 2r squared minus 4r plus 5 equals 0. That factors as 2 times r minus 2 squared plus 1 equals 0, which has no real roots at all. It just has complex roots, 2 plus or minus i over 2. So a fundamental set of solutions is in fact given by e to the 2x cos of x over 2, e to the 2x sine of x over 2. So thankfully, neither e to the x nor e to the minus x was in this fundamental set of solutions. So with neither of the exponentials in the forcing function being in the fundamental set we just found, we can very directly set yp2 to be something times e to the x, where that constant a is just the 6 from in front of e to the x, divided by the complementary polynomial evaluated at the power of 1. And the complementary polynomial was 2r squared minus 4r plus 5. The power here is 1x, so I take 2 1 squared minus 4 1 plus 5. This works out to just be 2. So yp2 is simply 2e to the x. We also take yp3 to be some constant times e to the minus x, and we do the same thing. We take this 2 as our numerator, and divide by the complementary polynomial evaluated at the power of negative 1. This works out to be 2 over 11. And therefore, we can set yp3 to be 2 over 11 times e to the minus x. And now to find the yp1, which will create the polynomial term x squared. Well, x squared is a polynomial of degree 2, so we assume that yp1 is also a polynomial of degree 2. Here's a generic polynomial of degree 2. Here's its derivative, here's its second derivative. Take all of this and throw it into the differential equation. 
2 times the second derivative minus 4 times the first derivative plus 5 times the original function, and what we are attempting to produce is just the term x squared. So we compare coefficients on like powers of x. What's the coefficient of x squared on the left? 5a. What's the coefficient of x squared on the right? 1. What's the coefficient of x? Negative 8a plus 5b versus 0. And what's the constant term? 2a minus 4b plus 5c versus 0. So we have set our solution yp1 to be a generic second degree polynomial, and we have managed to find that 5a is 1, minus 8a plus 5b is 0, and 2a minus 4b plus 5c is 0. The first gives me a as a fifth, which I take over to the second to give me b as negative 8 over 25, which we take over to the third to find that c is negative 42 over 125. Therefore, yp1 must be ax squared plus bx plus c. I'm just going to give it a common denominator of 125 for convenience. Now that we have found a yp1, which produces x squared, and a yp2, which produces 6e to the x, and a yp3, which produces 2e to the minus x, we apply the superposition principle to take the following sum and difference to let yp be the polynomial yp1 plus the exponential term yp2 minus the exponential term of yp3. We already knew a fundamental set of solutions to the complementary equation. So our general solution is given by this particular solution plus linear combinations of that fundamental set. So we have our particular solution. All of this is yp. And here is c1 times e to the 2x cos of x over 2, c2 e to the 2x sine x over 2, because our complementary equation had a fundamental set of solutions, e to the 2x cos of x over 2 and e to the 2x sine of x over 2. And there we have it. We have found all possible solutions to the differential equation that we started with. Altogether, where are we? If you have a second order linear differential equation with constant coefficients and the forcing function is an exponential. In other words, here's your general form. The only new problem compared to everything we already know is to find one particular solution. If lambda, the power on this exponential forcing function is not a root of the complementary polynomial, then all you have to do is let yp be a constant times e to the lambda x, where the constant is given by this coefficient k over the complementary polynomial evaluated at this power lambda. If, however, lambda is a root, but it's not the only one, well, then we let yp be ax e to the lambda x, where again, a has a nice explicit formula, k over 2 little a lambda plus b. And if lambda happens to be the only root of the complementary polynomial, you let yp be something times x squared e to the lambda x, where that something is explicitly computed as k over 2a. Also remember the superposition principle when your forcing function is a sum or difference of various terms. Don't try to do it all at once. Just do it one term at a time.